Gentles and ladymen, welcome back to the kitchen. I ask of you, what is the first instruction that we find when we're baking? If you said preheat your oven, I am in complete agreement with you. I find that as well. But today we're baking a recipe from 1976 titled a cold oven cake. And the idea of putting an unbaked good into an oven cold intrigues me. Because of course we were all taught, or at least I was, that a preheated oven to the correct temperature is of utmost importance for your baked good to turn out correctly. With that being said, there is something mildly exciting about breaking the rules, titillating even, so <laughs> let's dive in. So the recipe in question specifically comes from October of 1976 from this little ditty right here, the Women's Circle Home Cooking Periodical. These went under the subheading of the National Women's Home Cooking Club. And let me tell you, these are my favorite cookbooks ever. Which is something Many cookbook collectors would scoff at. They'd consider these trash or ephemera. They were mailed out en masse by subscription every month to all manners of people. There's nothing too much special about this, but I say no. And it's because these showcase what's actually going on in everyday kitchens of ordinary people like you and I. Every recipe in here is sent in by an average member of the public, strangely with their full names and addresses included. Now, professional, commercial, or restaurant cookbooks are fantastic. Don't get me wrong, I collect quite a few, but they don't provide an accurate depiction as to what food culture is at the time, you know? They showcase what people are striving to eat, whereas these and church or community cookbooks show us what people are actually eating. Now, we're here to bake a cake so let's talk cake. On page 47 of the cookbook, you'll find our recipe. And just looking at the ingredients, you'll see we have some peculiarities in front of us. We have two sticks of margarine. That's a full cup plus an additional half cup of Crisco shortening. Don't forget this was the 70s. Uh, moving on, we have three cups of sugar and three cups of flour. Now the one to one ratio between the sugar and the flour plus the large amount of fat should tell us that this is going to be akin to a pound cake. And that idea is confirmed by the minute amount of baking powder and the relatively large amount of eggs. Of course, we do have a cup of milk and some extracts on top of that for flavor. So. Let's get to it. We start with two sticks or one cup of margarine, also known as oleo, short for oleo margarine. And I can hear the collective sigh. Margarine gets a lot of bad press and most of it is for good reason, you know? It has an inferior taste to butter and butter is arguably better for you. But you know, I really hate this type of elitism in baking. If you're in your own kitchen baking for your own self, use whatever it is you want to use. You know, not only can some people not afford butter and it's wrong to flame them for it, but I believe margarine actually has its place. For example, I will admit to you that I use margarine willingly, not under coercion nor duress, for certain types of crispy cookies, like crispy oatmeal cookies or peanut butter cookies, God forbid, because I like the texture that margarine can provide. Cancel me. I do not use margarine in cakes, though. We can, we can leave that in the 70s. Now we need a half cup of Crisco shortening, and I brought out a scale because I can never accurately get displacement measurements of shortening. You get air pockets and it sticks to the cup, and because shortening has so much fat in it, uh, you never want it to be inaccurate or else your cake may fail. I believe it's a lot easier to know that a half cup of Crisco is 95 grams. In that goes. Now it's time for three cups of sugar, and I am going to cream this in one cup at a time. <laughs> Cup number two, and our last one in. You know, sugar in a carton is so much easier. So I have a lot of people on TikTok and YouTube who always ask as to why I don't use an electric mixer or a stand mixer to cream together my butter and my sugar, <laughs> or the margarine and the sugar in this case, because it's a very important step in baking, right? The creaming of fats and sugars, uh, especially in a pound cake like item like this. And really, I have two reasons. The first reason is I just really love to bake. So if I'm going to bake, I wanna bake. I wanna be down in the process. I wanna be well involved in the situation because I find it fun. And the second reason is simply not everyone has these things, right? Not everyone has a stand mixer. So when they see these $600 KitchenAids on television or YouTube, it gives them the wrong idea. It gives them the idea that if they don't have the gadgets, they can't bake the recipe. And that's just patently false. You'd be surprised what you can get done with a bowl, a wooden spoon, and a whisk. With that rant over with, we are done here with our margarine and our sugar. We have a light, fluffy texture, which has increased in volume. So we're ready for the eggies of which we need five put in one at a time. So we are on our third egg now, and as you can see, the mixture is becoming really quite smooth and it's taking on a lovely yellow golden color, which is a welcome departure from the sickly pale Crisco and margarine. Alrighty, all of the eggs have been incorporated, well beaten between each addition, so we're moving on to the dry ingredients. For this, we need three cups of sifted flour, so there's three in the sieve right now, and then only a half teaspoon of baking powder. 
Like I always say, I don't do this typically for recipes when I'm baking for myself, but in those that ask for it, you best know I do. We also need a cup of milk on hand, so we can alternate adding it to this mixture with the flour. So in goes a touch of flour, mix, and some of the milk. So the alternating of additions of things like milk to the dry ingredients is just so that we don't break the batter. If we added in all the milk at once, it would get far too loose, and it would threaten all of the air that we worked so very hard to incorporate during the earlier steps. More flour. I'll tell you what, unlike cakes made with butter, which smell really quite nice at this point, uh, this doesn't smell like anything. Oh, margarine. That's the last of the flour. The last of the milk. Look at how creamy and smooth our batter is. At this point, we add in the flavorings, which are one teaspoon of vanilla and one teaspoon of coconut. Now I know our cold oven cake to be here isn't billed as a pound cake, but I reckon that's what it's trying to be judging by the ingredients, like I said earlier. And it's going to be interesting because typically a pound cake recipe does not contain any flavoring, does not contain any milk, does not contain any baking powder, all of those we've added. So, uh, traditionally a pound cake recipe is just a pound each of butter, sugar, eggs, and flour. So I'm very interested as to how this is going to turn out. Our instructions are to turn this into a 10 inch tube pan. Now, I don't have one of those. The nearest I have is a similarly sized bunt pan, which is close enough. Um, I have buttered and floured this severely, which is very important with pound cake like items. You don't want this to stick. Uh, it happened to me once. Do not skimp on the process. So here we go. Look at those ribbons. Now, there is a chance that this is too much batter in this pan, but we're going to go for it anyway. Um, and as per instructions, our cold oven cake is going into a cold oven. We set a timer for one hour and 15 minutes, and we set the temperature to 350. 350, and one hour and 15. And now we wait. We've reached temperature after 12 minutes, and the cake is just starting to form some bubbles. This is 40 minutes in and still looking quite pale, got a bit more bubbles, but also starting to exceed the pan as I feared, but I think all will be okay. With about 10 minutes left on the bake, I wanted to share with you yet another reason why I adore these periodical cookbooks. And that is because of the small glimpses of current events that you find going on during the time in which they were published. And on page nine of this edition, you'll find an article titled, Getting Ready for the Metric Kitchen. And uh, let me just read this to you. The metrics are coming and there's no avoiding it. Our nation is rapidly preparing to join the rest of the world in adapting to a standard system of metric measurements. Within this century, we may see children's textbooks, business journals, and accountants' ledgers abandon the language of pounds, ounces, feet, and inches. These familiar names will be replaced by such terms as grams, liters, meters, and centimeters. And the change in language won't stop there. It will follow us all the way into the kitchen. <laughs> How'd that work out for you, America? Now, this article exists because Gerald Ford signed the Metric Conversion Act in December of 1975, and everyone was preparing to make the change, and some were quite upset. Uh, it was quickly repealed by Reagan in 1982, if memory serves correct. Uh, I just think stuff like this is hilarious. Oh, ain't that a beauty? Smells good now, too. So getting things out of bunt pans can be notoriously tricky. So my plan of action is to let this cool down for about five minutes, attempt to turn it out, and then we'll let it cool down completely before we try it. Here goes nothing. Ooh, hello! That is a massive cake. You're not cold anymore, are you? Alrighty, our cake has cooled and rested for about four hours now, so I reckon it's time to see what's on the inside. Ooh, it has quite the crispy crust. Cakes at this size are normally baked at 300 or 325, so this is going to be interesting. Whoa! Look at how tight that crumb is. Hello! Hmm. There's something quite special here. You have a browned, crispy exterior, but the inside is where the magic is. Uh, it's the tightest, most densest crumb I've experienced, um, and it almost lends itself to a fudgy consistency in a very positive way, but it isn't undercooked. It's it's very pleasant. The taste is also really good, which it shouldn't be, and I'm slightly miffed about. It has margarine and Crisco in it, but I do think that's just the three cups of sugar talking. This is a wonderful cake. Now the question is, is the cold oven the secret? Does it make a difference? 
and I'm inclined to say yes, that there's no way it doesn't make a difference. Starting the baking process at room temperature essentially gives a lot more time for the large bubbles to make their way to the top and pop before the cake starts to begin building its structure through heat. So as the temperature rises, the cake is building itself upon a finer network of air pockets. It creates a dense crumb and the structure builds gradually. Or at least that's my hypothesis. Do I think you'd get a vastly different cake if you bake this in a preheated oven? No, I'm quite sure you'd get something similar, but this method must just take it the extra mile. I'm not sold that these results are unique to the quote cold oven method either. I posit that you could get similar results if you say left the batter in the bunt pan for a little bit before you baked it in a preheated oven. Perhaps this is just the easiest or the most replicable way of getting these results in a cake. All I know is that it's fantastic and it uses margarine, which means if you use butter, it's gonna be really good. We should also give credit where credit is due. This recipe comes to us from Kathy. Oh dear. Um, Kathy N. from Huntington Station, New York. So it has been a few days, and initially I was quite content with uploading this video where it stood. However, if I were a cat, curiosity would have killed me a long time ago. Because Kathy from Huntington Station and her potentially problematic mispronounceable surname and her cold oven cake have been in my dreams. And they've driven me to want to bake this cake in a preheated oven just to see the difference it makes. Because I am truthfully fascinated with this cold oven idea, and I need to know whether or not that fascination is warranted or misplaced. So once again, we have our buttered and floured bunt pan, and we have our cake batter. Now our cake batter is prepared in the exact same manner as we just did previously. Same ingredients, same method. The only difference is we're going to be baking this in a preheated oven. Now I won't lie, there was a big part of me that wanted to change the oven temperature to something lower so that the exterior would not burn, because of course, with the cold oven cake, it was not exposed to that high temp for the entire time. It was cold. Old. Um, but then I said, no, you know, that's, that's changing too many variables. I want to see the difference between a preheated oven or a non-preheated oven. So we're just going to bake this at 350 and if it's done early, it's done early. Here we go again. All right, here we are, preheated oven, 350 in this boy goes. Do not worry, I will watch it closely. I expect it to be done around the same amount of time, of course, just uh, slightly earlier. So this is the 40 minute mark on our hot oven cake and it looks more or less the same. Perhaps it's a bit rounder than the previous. Alrighty, this, oh dear, this boy was done in one hour and five minutes and it looks definitively different. Just on first inspection, this one has cracked a lot more markedly and it's domed more as well. Let's see how this works. Oh, hello. This angle looks more or less the same, but we're gonna let it cool. Oh, this, feel, this feels different. It's it's jiggly. Oh, peculiar. That certainly is a different crumb, isn't it? I mean, it's not vastly different, but let's see if it tastes it. Wow, that is different. It's just not as good. The crumb is more crumbly. It, it's not as well put together. It's, uh, it tastes drier. The positive fudgy-like consistency of the previous cake is gone. The density as well. I can't say with any degree of certainty that one of these cakes tastes better than the other, but I can say with certainty that I feel as if the previous cake tasted better. And it brings to light an important note, which is texture of a baked good plays a more important role in taste perception than you think. And I much prefer the previous cake. To be honest with you, I did not expect this much of a difference. I expected this cake's outer shell to be a bit more burnt and crispy compared to the other. That's it. But this it, it, it certainly validates Kathy, doesn't it? Now I am an amateur. I only started baking with my TikTok back in 2020. So if any of you folks have any information on cold oven cakes or cold oven methods, please do let me know in the comments. I'd be very interested reading them. All I know is I have a lot of cake to eat. So that's it for me today and I'll be seeing you quite soon. This was fun.